Thank you so much for inviting me, Craig Hawkins and team who saw me present in New York a little while ago and asked if I would come out and spend some time with you. Such a big group. I thought it might be a, a smaller forum. So this is great. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Craig. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> All right. Let me just make sure that, uh, that I know how. There we go. Uh, so I'm Mimi Brooks. I'm the CEO of Logical Design Solutions, and um, we're a management consultancy, and we work with large organizations on their digital transformations. Uh, we started this work about five years ago, and um, I wanted to share with you some common lessons learned that I've seen over those years. Um, and because they're lessons at the beginning of uh, my talk here, they're necessarily going to be things that I think um, we didn't do as right as in retrospect. Um, it would have been uh, wiser. And so I'll share those with you. And then I'll spend more of my time talking about um, what I think are the imperatives for the next wave of digital transformation. I'm on a pretty uh, limited time, so if you don't mind, I'm going to follow my script. I had said to, uh, to Craig, I speak a lot, but I don't really get um, asked to speak for entertainment, you know, more for research and discovery. He said this was a good forum for that, so <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and see how it goes. Okay, so um, as you probably know, we're in the early stages of the fourth industrial revolution, and while the first used water and steam power to mechanize production, the second used electric power to create mass production. Then the third, which started in the middle of the last century, used electronics and information technology to automate production. This latest revolution is really a continuation of the third, and at the core of the fourth industrial revolution is the fusion of digital innovation and human interaction. This is resulting in wholesale changes to traditional business models and extraordinary organizational disruption. The speed and magnitude of these changes will continue to intensify as advances in areas such as artificial intelligence, big data, quantum computing, machine learning, the industrial internet of things gather momentum. The current pace of change, while fast, is likely to be slower than the pace of change in the future. In business, we're starting to understand the full impact. The exponential nature of change occurs at a dizzying, nonlinear, and continuous pace. The technology itself is combinatorial and amplifying. Data fuels IoT, which accelerates AI and deep learning, which propels robotics, and so on. As leaders grapple with the uncertainty brought about by rapid technological change, the good news is that adaptation does not require predicting the future. Far more critical is developing a mindset that considers system-level effects versus technologies, prioritizing the impact on individuals and workers in an empowering but not determining way, and designing the future versus letting it happen by default. Said another way, we're not going to control or manage this environment, nor can we humanly set our pace to it. Mindset as an appreciation, expectation idea, and momentum as purposeful forward motion, knowing that course adjustments are part of the journey in business are key ideas. These last 10 years, believe it or not, we've been in the fourth industrial revolution for 10 years now, are synonymous in my mind with the first wave of the fourth industrial revolution, and they help to give context to the circumstances we observe the pace of unending change, leaders uncertain about what the future looks like, our organizational hierarchies not working with us, and the lack of readiness of our workforce. We can likely expect the next 10 years to be equally as dramatic as the first. Developing trends will reshape the future competitive environment. Traditional industry boundaries will continue to blur, 
Corporate life cycles are likely to continue to shrink, and companies will need to compete on faster time scales made possible by autonomous data systems working at algorithmic speed. But they'll also compete on resilience by weathering slow-moving, unanticipated forces such as social and political change that are increasingly affecting business. In this environment, leaders will, leaders will need to design our new, adaptive, resilient, innovative, human-machine organizations. And they need to do so without knowing precisely where they are headed. Instead of finding this uncertainty paralyzing, they'll need to balance waves of successive and strategic evolutions with stepping stones that support near-term progress while allowing for adaptability. It's the analogy of not knowing the second step until you've taken the first. So with these ideas in hand and 10 years under our belt in the first wave of digital transformation, what have we learned? As a general comment, digital transformation as a label, God bless you, didn't serve business well in this first phase of the fourth industrial revolution. It was confusing nomenclature to describe the impact that extraordinary technologies would have on our lives, on our work, and on our relationships with each other. In the process, we lost the big why. We didn't understand it was the fourth industrial revolution and all of its forces, and in doing so, we lost the context, and we couldn't see the magnitude of the disruption ahead. Instead, we focused on the things we could understand, the digital things. We had goals like automation, cloud, social, analytics. This spawned dozens, sometimes hundreds, of digital projects, often with unclear strategic purpose, no central control or coordination, no means to shut down the poor performers, and no clear way to move successful ones forward to enterprise scale. In the absence of a cohesive business digital strategy, our strongest structures, which are vertical, dominated. Digital grew in silos that mirrored our organizational silos to unknown value. On the edges of this technology-centric approach were our people, the changing work that wasn't being redesigned in our various lines of businesses or functions, our collective organizational capabilities that were becoming steadily insufficient. We couldn't shield our people from the continual vibration, and yet we couldn't prepare the organization for it either. To observe the myriad impacts that resulted, I'll cite five. <clears throat> the first lesson learned is that we got stuck someplace between buying digital and trying to be digital. So if you look at this chart, I'm suggesting that there were a lot of efforts to acquire and apply digital in the context of our current business models to either known pain points or to known operational contexts. And we swirled there. We kind of got stuck, the red dot stuck, between you know, the idea of buying digital and what was necessary to become a digitally capable organization the basis of which is a new business model, a new business strategy, and an operating model to support it. So we went digital on the edges, if you will, and got stuck in this idea of looking and feeling like we were digital, you know, only to find limited value in return. The second lesson learned is that the fourth industrial revolution is turning organizational structures inside out as vertical structures and their silos alone simply can't function and support the full strategy of our digital first business environment. As I mentioned previously, early digital projects were implemented in isolated pockets where their impact mirrored organizational silos and were impeded by long established boundaries between functions. These heavily instantiated vertical functions, still largely in place today, need to soften as the lines between functions and business units blur, and horizontal organizational capabilities 
and cross-functional initiatives powered by digital innovations emerge. The first wave of the fourth industrial revolution focused on culture and engagement. There was barely an industry forum that you could attend in the last five years whose focus wasn't, at least in large part, on culture and engagement. The third lesson from the first wave is the critical idea that new work and new work practices are needed for culture to sustainably change. Our focus on culture realized minimal results in the first part of the fourth industrial revolution because we didn't redesign the organization itself. We didn't redesign leadership. We didn't redesign formal work as aggressively as we needed to. And we didn't link informal work practices to the behaviors and mindsets that would be needed to drive sustainable culture. We know this now going into the next subsequent wave. Our fourth lesson is that evolving the human-machine relationship where people and automation coexist through work allocation and design is a critical aspect of any digital transformation strategy and must be made integral to critically needed organization design. For, any, for many organizations, the amount of fully automated work is small compared to the amount of work expected to be performed in a hybrid partnership. As humans increasingly take their hands off the wheel at work and rely on machines to do as much and understand and contribute as much as possible, which is the objective, this area will be a critical focus of organization and work design. We're entering the second wave of digital transformation, perhaps most unprepared in this regard, with issues ranging from ethical design to social and economic policies to ready leadership and an equipped workforce. Related, this is the concept of learning on multiple time scales. I want to make sure that you understand what people say when they, what they mean when they say that. While you're optimizing machine learning at an exponential time scale, you're also trying to optimize your worker learnings within a, albeit slower, human time scale. But that also includes the consideration of social, political, and economic forces that are shaping the business model. In a nutshell, we must expand contemporary organizational learning to both faster and slower time scales. This is what we mean by competing at the rate of learning, and digitally capable and native companies work exactly like that. Sometimes I think when we talk about this lesson learned, that businesses think we want people to learn faster, like they somehow need to learn faster than the way they learn today, which is obviously a uh, misrepresentation of the concept. The fifth and final lesson learned is that we need to provide leaders with better methodologies for managing ongoing large-scale change. This notion of organizational design in the business ecosystem is largely driven by an executive mindset that creates momentum in the workforce through astute vision and leadership and by leveraging progressive decision-making. Employees participate when we equip them with modern tools when we develop them with durable skills and provide relevant insights that help to build and extend these durable skills. And now, a new fully integrated, digitally driven work process processes are both designed and continually enhanced. We need leaders to model this future state for people in order to show what good looks like we need our digital ecosystems to work harder to support organizational change and to be worker-centric by design. In other words, these digital ecosystems must be contextual and iterative to the new work and support the decision-making practices we want people to use in the future state. What does unbiased decision-making look like? What does team-based decision-making look like? How do best ideas win inside the organization? What do we mean by balancing data-informed decision-making with people's work experience, which is what they normally overweight in a decision-making context? 
So those are the five lessons that I think we realized in the first phase of uh, digital transformation. So let me take it a little forward and uh, show you some of the imperatives I think that we can think about as we enter the next wave over the next, uh, let's say, 10 years or so. <clears throat> as we uh, progress into the second wave of the fourth industrial revolution, one thing we can say with certainty is that the first wave was particularly brutal on early affected legacy companies and their market. You know, with some foundation, digital foundation, likely realized from the first wave, you know, what can we say are the plausible imperatives? We cite these five as key imperatives for the second wave of the fourth industrial revolution, and they'll affect vir virtually every aspect of contemporary business. Gone are the days of competing in vertical markets with long-term products and services. Now we talk in terms of temporary serial advantage or what we are calling transient advantage strategies with business ecosystems. We must also look at the astonishing pace and impact of AI and ML on our workplaces and how we must nurture our core employees to adopt what we're calling durable skills. Businesses will need agile and innovative organizational structures as we move away from traditional hierarchy and into the realm of end-to-end -end team accountability in a much more flattened environment. One of the more intriguing second wave imperatives is the idea that the worker and customer experience must become indiscernible. What this means is that we go a step farther than the concept of treating our workers as well as we do our customers for the sake of world-class customer service, and we move, rather, into the realm where we recognize that in a multi-ecosystem economy, it is very possible that our worker actually is our customer. Last but certainly not least is the fact that we must focus on technology governance. Make no mistake, ethics play a major role in the second wave, and those who underestimate the importance of technology govern governance will suffer the consequences of public scrutiny and criticism, some of which we began to see at the end of our last phase. So let's take a look at these initiatives and see if any of them resonate with you. The first is about business strategy. Transient advantage strategies support the premise that sustainable competitive advantage is now the exception, not the rule. More customer-centric, fluid, and less industry-bound strategies are needed. A transient strategy focuses on the velocity of competitive advantage. Let me just describe that in a bit more detail. Companies must become exceptional through differentiation in approaches such as, number one, creating new products for markets that have fewer choices due to established regulatory and other roadblocks, roadblocks to competitive uh, intrusion. Opportunity two, become exceptional through scale and cost. Among other factors, this means establishing and maintaining market share no matter what, provided that the growth rate exceeds the anticipated rate of return. This also means pricing new products as low as necessary to either dominate the market segment or to cease sales if that dominance is not quickly established. Option three, ensure that business processes are so streamlined that a company can be first to market with a high quality, low cost product. To compete with transient advantage strategies, company must con companies must consider industry benchmarks as unviable measures of excellence. Companies now must compete in ecosystem arenas, not just vertical structures. We need to focus our metrics on customer needs in addition to uh, operational efficiency and to exploit short-term transient advantage strategies. We need to build networks with our employees and leverage the network effects of employees participating much as we do with digital first companies that leverage consumer participation. We need to go beyond data analytics to business insights and business insights to action. 
and we need to examine the ecosystem patterns and conduct direct observation and interpret emerging business themes. Each of these ideas will enable individuals to flourish in the social digital enterprise that is becoming the cornerstone of the second wave. With the expansion of digital capabilities and mass automation, human resourcing will face unprecedented turmoil as repetitive and routine jobs vanish from the workplace and skills like adaptability, connectedness, open-mindedness, entrepreneurial outlook, and time management rise to prominence. We need to embrace this opportunity to nurture not soft skills, durable skills. To put it in perspective, the second wave is eliminating repetitive and routine jobs as a result of automation and the rise of AI as well as other technologies. This new paradigm is making traditional skill sets relevant for shorter and shorter periods of time. Workers require ongoing upskilling and reskilling to move up the value chain. Workers themselves must display ever greater creativity and emotional intelligence, regardless of whether they are gig economists or, or employed full time at the same company. Nurturing these digital skills will be key to the survival of educational establishments and business alike. As a word of caution, there are several upskilling hurdles facing second wave businesses related to the workforce. Millennials, for example, are job transient, often changing companies or jobs every two to three years. Gig and contingent workers already constitute over 40% of the workforce, and this, this percentage is growing exponentially. Building corporate knowledge and job loyalty is becoming more and more of a challenge for employers, and workers are working longer, longer hours while their skills are becoming obsolete faster. It's predicted that 85% of all of the jobs the economy will need in 2030 have not yet been invented. Our recommendations are that businesses need to place larger emphasis on the development of durable skills across the education continuum. They need to increase access to employer-based training opportunities, create easier opportunities for workforce re-engagement in the higher education system, and finally, create three-way partnerships among government, higher education, and employers. If business can move forward with these goals, we will nurture a workforce that is well prepared for the challenges of the second wave. The third imperative, successful second wave companies are developing fundamentally different organizational structures than those traditional business units and practices. There are several good reasons why the second wave is infiltrating the traditional industry paradigm of organizational hierarchy. In order to survive during the second wave, we believe that business must acknowledge the need for coexisting horizontal structures for products and platforms along with their traditional vertical structures like business units, et cetera. So regardless, we need to embrace shared standardized processes across all business, pro business functions, regardless of whether these are operational, customer facing, or back office. These processes will no longer be siloed into functional hierarchies, but instead will be managed by technologically adept networks of teams whose mission is to work agnostically with sales, marketing, service, and operational assets, while also utilizing artificial intelligence and machine learning to mine and leverage massive amounts of data. An overarching business strategy will be needed that encompasses design thinking and the application of agile methodologies to promote product ownership and provide a direct line of sight from senior leadership to the front line. We are not suggesting the demise of the hierarchical organization as we know it here, but rather the integration of agile and innovative horizontal structures 
in parallel. The worker and the customer experience must become indiscernible. Second wave platforms that include the customer experience, the worker experience, the employee experience will activate new complex business ecosystems and leverage technology to create frictionless interactions among workers, partners, suppliers, and customers. Forward-looking organizations will equate the worker experience to that of the customer in order to drive collaboration across the entire business platform. We believe that successful second wave companies will continue to adopt a user-centric mindset that reaches every corner of the organization and treats every employee as the customer. A concerted worker focus in the digital workplace will foster collaboration between employees and customers alike. Gig workers will increasingly assume the dual roles of brand advocates and discerning customers. As traditional IT responsibilities fall away, software selection, systems integration, updates, massive rounds of testing, et cetera, we dissolve, those in, we dissolve into the second wave and the employee experience will become the primary focal point. As vertical markets evolve into ecosystems and digitalization transforms traditional ways of working, the traditional distinction between workers and customers is becoming increasingly blurred. Second wave platforms function as technology-enabled business models that create value by facilitating exchanges and interactions among employees, workers, and customers. These platforms unify people, processes, policies, and networked technology to enable value exchanges throughout the ecosystem. Viewing employees and workers as end users is insufficient in the second wave environments. Each of these need, need to be seen as the buyer. Finally, my fifth. We live in an age of heightened sensitivity to matters of personal privacy and corporate integrity. This concern will only grow as the second wave gains momentum. We believe that companies must make themselves immune to criticism and intense public scrutiny by adopting a thoughtful technology governance strategy that encourages trust and places the common good in front and center of all business practices regardless of whether a business engages in biotech research or consumer product marketing, it's imperative that the company adopts rules, procedures, and requirements that protect data privacy, ensure human health, and care for the well-being of employees and customers. <clears throat> One concept, if you haven't heard of it, that's gaining, that is gaining precedence in this area is the notion of using what the industry is calling an agile manifesto to, in order to achieve better technology governance during this second wave. This approach focuses on individuals and interactions rather than processes and tools and on working product rather than on comprehensive documentation. It also highlights the need for customer collaboration over contract negotiation and quick responses to change rather than rigidly following a plan. While it does not negate the importance of those elements shown on the right, it does place a higher value of those on the left. So there are a few rules of thumbs that will enable companies to refocus on technology governance. These include transparency, the engagement of legal and policy frameworks, common understanding of ethics within the company, understanding the best interests of all stakeholders in your ecosystem, and designing ethical considerations into your products and services. In summary, launching an ambitious strategy and building a flexible business model 
are essential parts of digital transformation. Just as important to success is how well and how quickly a company can assemble the capabilities required to execute that strategy as it evolves. Along with systems and technology, talent and culture, data and analytics, the company's operating model is one of the biggest challenges to change in digital transformation efforts. As we have seen, a significant lesson learned from the first wave of digital, digital transformation focused on the need to design new, digitally-centric operating models that bust internal silos, create cross-functional collaboration to unite on common operational and organizational goals without having to have everything centralized, and to coordinate and incubate meaningful initiatives with the purpose of embedding them back into the business at the right time for the benefit of all or most. This second wave demands the adoption of transient advantage, advantage strategies, the nurturing of durable skills, the adoption of agile and innovative organization structures, the amalgamation of the worker and customer experience, and an intense focus on technical governance. Thank you.